everyone and welcome to another episode of Sharing the Couch. Sharing the Couch is a podcast. We're now in our second season. We're really pleased to be able to continue to bring to you a number of conversations from professionals, leaders, today a Chief Executive Officer from across our sector, uh, across Australia, people and organisations who are doing marvellous things and trying to look at the problems we have in housing and homelessness from a different perspective. Today we're going to hear about youth foyers. What is a youth foyer? And what's this about this really ambitious goal to have 50 youth foyers by 2030? Sounds like a really exciting growth uh, in an area for housing and homelessness, but what does it mean? So today we're going to be talking to the CEO of the Youth Foyer Foundation, Liz Cameron Smith, an arts graduate in government and international relations from the University of Sydney. Liz Cameron Smith first joined PwC in 2009 after a two and a half year stint as a policy officer with the Department of Immigration and Citizenship, during which time she also served as an Australian Youth Ambassador for Development in China with a Global Health Fund, sorry, with a Global Fund, and its aim to eradicate HIV, TB and malaria worldwide. Liz initially served as a senior consultant before taking on a senior manager role with The Difference an innovative business unit which draws from disciplines such as psychology, neuroscience and design thinking to help transform organisational culture and among other areas, embed new ways of working. From that sprung the Impact Assembly, which focuses on complex societal challenges. The Impact Assembly works with not-for-profits, philanthropists, communities and other organisations across sectors to co-design innovative solutions to issues such as obesity, mental health, education inequality and homelessness, the latter of which was a focus area of PwC's social impact work. During her time there, Liz's team worked with community, corporate and government partners to establish more than 10 alliances designed to shift systems. Each initiative brought together hundreds or thousands of people across an ecosystem uh, together around issues that include homelessness, which was part of the Constellation Project, the human services sector, known as the Possibility Project, Equity in Our Learning Recognition System through Learning Creates Australia, Climate Change through the Climate Leaders Coalition, Cricket for Climate, Early Childhood Development and more. During her tenure at PwC, Liz was core to the collaborative structure and development of highly innovative projects from an incubation phase through to governance, launch and execution, working closely with organisations including Paul Ramsey Foundation, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, Mission Australia and Uniting. This has managed multi-level investments and commitments from philanthropic, corporate and government partners in collaboration with community partners in the for-purpose sector. As well as her skills in relationship building, strategy and management, Liz brings practical knowledge and experience of the structural, political and policy context affecting young people. I'd also like just to say that we are broadcasting today from the lands of Larrakia people and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past and present, and to any other First Nations people who may be watching on. Liz, very warm welcome to you. Hello. Thank you, Peter. That was uh, quite the introduction, but I'm, I'm very thrilled to be here. And also just want to acknowledge that I'm joining from Terra Marigua land, which is part of the Eora Nation uh, in the sort of north and northwestern part of Sydney, and I pay respects to elders past and present as well. Wonderful, Liz. We're really happy to have you on the program. I am so excited to be learning a bit more about youth foyers today. I've got to say I've been fortunate enough to step inside two foyers, uh, one down in Melbourne and one in um, in WA, and they're pretty special places, aren't they? They really are. They really are. We've heard um, some of our young people talk about the fact that it doesn't matter which foyer you step into across the country, they always feel the same, which I think speaks a lot to you know, the intangible qualities as much as the, the the physical structure of a foyer. There is certainly something about when you walk inside the door, there is a, a, a positive vibe, isn't there? And I remember in the, at the Oxford one, there are a number of plates on the wall, if memory serves me correctly, with different corporate sponsors, which I thought was really reassuring to see other corporates and philanthropy involved. How would you describe to someone who hasn't stepped inside a foyer about just what it felt like, you know, maybe for you when you started visiting a few? Sure. So I think when I think of a foyer, um, really it conjures up the word home. And I think especially for young people that have come from a home life that obviously wasn't creating the kind of safe and stable opportunities that they needed, 
hence their attraction to, to FOIA to begin with. Um, it does create that sense of community, sense of belonging. Um, many of our young people talk about it as their forever family and a sense of forever belonging, um, which I think just captures up the feeling before we probably get to what's actually underneath the roof of a FOIA. Yeah. Now, Liz, you, um, you went to the University of Sydney, you did a Bachelor of Arts and Honours degree there in, in government and international relations, and then you um, you followed that up in 2010 to 2013 with a Master in Applied Anthropology and Participatory Development, also with a stint in China that I mentioned before. Tell us a bit about yourself. You've got to have many different career pathways available to you. You've come out of Sydney Uni. How did you find yourself in, in this field of work where you are today? Uh, look... It's a great question. I think that I have always been very drawn to people that are, are very different to myself. And probably when I was younger, that meant I was very drawn to the international development arena. And I, I probably had thought that that was where my career would end up. Um, that is what took me to China. Um, you know, I've always been fascinated by different people, different cultures, different ways of seeing the world and trying to get a better understanding of that. And I think through that, I've always been really interested in how you empower the people that a solution is, is designed for, um, how you empower them as part of the solution design process rather than assuming that you know what's best for them. Um, and I think you can imagine I was incredibly out of my comfort zone in a context like China. I was working in an organization that was in Mandarin. Um, I, I half the time had no idea what was going on and yet was expected to um, really proactively contribute to the solutions around HIV prevention and control. Um, it was at a time in China where the government had just relaxed its laws um, around non-government non organisations. Um, we saw a whole pr proliferation of community-based organisations starting to pop up um, who I suppose were relatively inexperienced when it came comes to how you run strategies and deliver programs and do monitoring and evaluation and things that many not-profits here are very familiar with. Um, and in the process, I got really interested in how you actually convene and bring order to a very chaotic environment like that, where you've got lots of different organisations all trying to achieve a very similar objective. Um, and that's what really got me interested in collaboration across sectors and across organisations and how you actually design solutions collaboratively. Um, which is what eventually led me back to, to PwC and, and my consulting. I wanted to learn some skills that I thought I would stay in the sector for two years and jump back into the not-for-profit space immediately afterwards um, and ended up staying a little bit longer than I had planned. Um, but in the end, it's given me an incredible platform for understanding the differences between sectors, the different strengths and resources and capabilities they've got to draw on and how you really um, organise across such a diverse group of people towards a common purpose, um, which does align very well with what we're trying to do through the FOIA Foundation right now. Yeah, and Liz, in your own words, you've said you're a big picture thinker. Um, you've said that it's important to work creatively to imagine new possibilities uh, for our future and often by bringing people together and unlikely combinations of people together to do that, um, to look around common social and environmental goals. And you've also said we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used that we created them. Can you expand on that for us a little bit around that, that thinking and 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 the importance of bringing together people potentially from unlikely areas into an ecosystem, as you would say, to work on these problems together? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I, I think one of the things that I've seen a lot throughout the last, you know, phase of my career is this sense that sometimes the system doesn't work that well in whatever social issue we're talking about because we have organisations or sectors that remain siloed and fragmented. And I think we see that across sectors as well as within them. 
Um, I think we've probably all experienced the siloing and fragmentation that can happen even within government departments and within governments. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important is that we rise above this sense of fragmentation and putting things in boxes and actually look at what is the actual outcome we're trying to achieve here mm -hmm. and what is it going to take to achieve that outcome using what combination of people's skill sets, capabilities from any sector. So I'm, I'm relatively agnostic as to which sector we need to be pulling on at any one point in time. Mm -hmm. I think each sector has its own unique set of strengths and resources and skills to offer. Um, and it's actually up to all of us to really reimagine how we might bring those strengths together in different ways in service of an outcome. Okay. So in terms of, an, I guess, an insidious challenge for us like um, youth homelessness, um, for example, what are your thoughts there around how we maybe reshape the way we think about solving that problem using this kind of thinking, whether it be through the Constellation Project initiative that you, uh, you stood up or through some other avenue? Sure. Um, I might come back to the Constellation Project, but but I think youth homelessness is a great example to get a bit more practical about what I mean. Um, I think even when you look at something like youth homelessness and actually think about the young person at the heart of that, that we're actually working with, hopefully not for, but with, um, you know, usually that young person has experienced a whole range of things of which homelessness is just one factor. Um, and so I think we have to acknowledge that people are these, you know, pretty complex beings with lots of different levels of, of challenge and support that they might need to, to realise their ambitions in life. Um, I think it it's naive to think that any one organisation or sector can meet all of those needs and supports for one person. And I think we also have to acknowledge that that person is going to grow up and travel through this complex network and ecosystem of services, whether they're government services or not-for-profit services, or hopefully and ideally moving off to dependence of those sorts of services and instead um, engaging in mainstream education and employment and, and housing. So to think about how do we actually enable this young person to move from a situation of crisis through to a situation of independence is going to require a whole lot of different players from across that ecosystem over the course of a number of years. Um, and I think instead of trying to think about what's the one program we need to deliver to this person or this group of people, we should be thinking about how do we enable this individual to move differently through the system and where are the gaps that someone could be falling through the cracks that we need to plug. So it's really zooming up and seeing that full picture. And I think in particularly, um, you know, uh, I think about through youth homelessness, but it could be through any kind of homelessness and housing situations. Um, it's really important we don't forget the private sector and the role of the private sector in solving some of these issues. Um, we certainly know that they can play a role in contributing to the issues, in contributing to the housing market, in contributing to rental pressures. And if we don't engage with the business sector in figuring out how to solve these entrenched issues, that they are part of the system that creates them, um, then we're really only looking at part of, of the solution. Yeah, I'd like to share share a story and, and perhaps uh, expand on that a little bit because I remember when I came up to the Territory about five years ago, I went down to Alice Springs and I remember on the local newspaper there was a silhouetted picture of a kid with a hoodie on and talking about youth crime and I couldn't help but think that kids are getting a bit of a tough rap down here um, with all the, all the problems that are attributed to them. And at the time I was told it was a relatively small number of kids that were um, we were getting into trouble, not by, by any means the whole lot of kids, of course, but there was that stigma around children and young people. And I, I went out to have a meeting with one of the um, youth centres that provides after our school care to, to kids. And she showed me a picture. It was, uh, it was the Gap Youth Centre down in Alice Springs, and I was just celebrating 40 years of inception. 
And uh, the the person there at the time showed me uh, a picture of one of the one of the kids who had gone on to dance with the um, Bangara Dance Theatre Company, and I thought, what a wonderful example of the potential of kids um, and the opportunities and uh, that they can realise when they have a chance at working with them to to realise the potential. Maybe this is a good lead into your thoughts around young kids and what you're trying to do at youth uh, foyers uh, and and what a youth foyer essentially is about. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Peter. That's great. Um, look, I, th I think I love that story that you've told because I think what it does is show the way a lot of services continue and in the system continue to portray young people through this deficit lens. And actually what we're trying to do through Youth Foyers is really flip that and instead see a young person for their potential and really work walk alongside them as partners to help them realize their ambitions in life and reach independence. Um, now, now, having said that, the the group that we work with has usually experienced or is at risk of homelessness. Um, and what a foyer is is about creating a safe and stable home for up to two years with integrated learning and work supports. Um, and it's really centred around this concept of a deal, which is a deal between the young person and the staff of a foyer to walk alongside that young person, help them to unlock and define what their goals are in learning and life, and then put in place the right supports needed to help them get there, um, whether that means supporting them to attend TAFE or university or supporting them with other life skills courses like independence life skill courses, um, doing a whole range of things that actually meet that young person where they are um, and, and is completely designed around what their own ambitions in life are. So really the idea is to give them that, that agency in their future direction, but also to really see them for their potential and not tell them that they're always going to be trapped in this cycle that they might be temporarily experiencing, but that they have a pathway to independence. And um, it might be helpful to mention that each foyer can house up to about 40 people usually. I think there's there's a range. We've got some that have 12 and you've seen the one in WA that has 98. So there's a range in, in the models that are actually used across the country, but it also creates a sense of community and peer support between other young people that have been in similar situations as well. And how does a young person find their way into a youth foyer? What's the typical pathway? And I guess what are the providers looking for when they're working out who should they take on as a candidate? Yeah, so I suppose one thing to say is that foyers are, are delivered by a whole range of different service providers across the country. Um, there's 11 that are accredited right now and we'll have 20 accredited by the end of this year. Um, each service provider really does it slightly differently, but the main ways for a young person to enter a foyer is either to be referred by another service, particularly, you know, a specialist homelessness support service. Um, young people can refer themselves. So if they know that it's a service on offer in their community, they can usually go to the website and do a self-referral. Um, which we do find is actually one of the most powerful ways in because it already demonstrates that that young person is really taking ownership of their life and direction and, and seeking out the support that they want to, to realise their goals. And these youth foyers, they're not exactly a franchise network of McDonald's outlets. They're not all the same, are they? They, they are a little bit different and unique and there's innovations encouraged within the um, network. But could you step us through the, the ingredients that I guess an accredited foyer might have? And I think that was one of the things that was really uh, appealing when I read through uh, just to learn a bit about the FOIA network around how you do, do have um, a number of key elements like integrity and impact, innovation and the like, but also the um, the, the type of thinking, I'm just trying to look through my notes now to remember what it's called, it's, it's, it's some type of thinking. Advantage, advantage thinking. That's it, advantage <laughs> thinking, thank you for that. Can you tell us what that is? That sounds quite interesting. Yeah, so advantage thinking you know, in a nutshell is what I described earlier. So it's it's really seeing the young person through a positive frame that is about their talents and potential and their capabilities rather than seeing them through a deficit-based lens. Um, 
advantage thinking is not new. It has been around for decades, um, particularly in the UK where the FOIA movement really took off. And at one point, there were about 170 FOIAs in the country, all using advantage thinking. Um, and so within advantage thinking, we have developed and in partnership with our colleagues in the UK and, and Colin Falconer, who really established it as, as a practice, we have developed a set of standards um, that cover a whole range of aspects of a youth FOIA from everything to the way the service is operated, the culture in the service, the environment, the physical environment, the communal spaces that exist to enable um, community and that sense of belonging through to the way the staff ratio is set up, the way the organisation is governed. There's a whole lot of standards that cover off on these different aspects of a service, eight different service standards. Um, and the FOIA Foundation runs the accreditation process that is really about making sure that every FOIA that we have is offering every young person, whichever FOIA you walk into, the same consistent quality of experience. So there is an element that is consistent. Having said that, the actual deployment of that model does vary from place to place, which is entirely appropriate given that we need it to be you know, place-based and fit for the local context, the local community, the local employment market, um, and really designed in partnership with that community to meet the needs of young people locally. Um, so we see slightly different flavours depending on where it's located and what those needs are. Um, an example of that is in, in Sydney, FOIA Central focuses predominantly on young people that have left the out-of-home care system and have, have looked at how they need to tailor the model to work predominantly with that particular cohort of young people. Um, we've also seen work underway in Broome looking at how do you really create a First Nations-led service model that is designed for a, you know, pretty much 100% population that is First Nations that is going to be in need of those services, which would look very different to um, other services, even though all have um, a very important core of, of cultural safety at the heart of them. So it sounds like you have very you have a strong set of principles and integrity is one of the key elements to this as well. But you are able to offer different, I guess, uh, variations to take into account people from, uh, I guess, um, different multicultural backgrounds or First Nations people as well. Yeah, and I, I think you know a, a core part of what we will drive at the FOIA Foundation is not only upholding the integrity from an accreditation and quality assurance perspective, but also driving innovation in the model as, you know, our communities change, our economy changes, the needs of young people evolve. We need to be able to adapt with them while not losing what is core to the model that we know actually generates the, the best outcomes. It struck me also as being important to the success of the FOIA model uh, that the evidence base was a strong evidence base was very important as well have you found that useful in terms of growing the the um, I guess the the confidence in the FOIA model from government and potentially from philanthropy and investors as well did you, did you find that evidence base has served you well yeah absolutely uh, I mean the 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 proof of a model is what it enables you to do and, and what outcomes it actually achieves um what has been interesting in the Australian setting is that because we have had different services across the country delivering the FOIA model, um, each service traditionally has collected outcomes in a different way. So what the FOIA Foundation has been doing in partnership with the Brotherhood of St Lawrence is building a nationally consistent uh, impact measurement framework that will you know, we've been consulted with FOIAs across the country so that we're getting to a place where we have a very consistent way of reporting that information. Um, but we have also been working with Accenture. We've commissioned them to do a social and economic analysis of FOIAs nationally. And the results from that have been incredibly compelling. Um, we know that 80% of young people that exit a youth FOIA exit into stable housing. Um, there's significantly better outcomes in education and employment um, when, when compared to mainstream specialist homelessness services. So the evidence base is strong and 
when we look at individual foyers, we know, for example, in places like Logan, the Logan Youth FOIA um, has been in operation for about five years. And over that time, um, there's been a 92% success rate of young people in education, some form of education or employment. So they're incredibly compelling outcomes. Um, yes, we need we need a very solid evidence base to be engaging with government and potential investors around FOIAs. And that's exactly why we're um, really looking at how we make that nationally consistent into the future as well. well. I think it's worth pointing out also for the benefit of the viewers and listeners that uh, Accenture found that for every $1 spent, there was about a $6 return to government, I guess, through, through young people ending up getting jobs, paying taxes, not going so much into the health system or having to apply for private, for social and affordable housing. So there's a whole lot of benefits to government, aren't there, in terms of an effective model? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it really stems from the fact that while a young person's time in a foyer is finite, it's capped at about two years, um, the outcomes and the impact really last their lifetime. It's about actually shifting the life trajectory so that they become independent adults um, with less dependence on welfare, less dependence on housing, less dependence on employment supports and less presentations in the justice system as well. So Accenture found that for every young person, there was a $386,000 benefit that was shared by state and, and federal governments. Um, and we also found that it was shared roughly evenly. So those benefits um, we're not just in the state-based setting, but also in the federal setting, um, which I think creates a really compelling case for why the federal government should be investing in youth foyers alongside state, state and territory governments as well. Some people might think two years isn't a very long time to, I guess, get a young person's life on track. But when I look at the stats coming out of Broadmeadows, for example, 100% of them getting into private rental and 80% getting into some form of paid employment, it's a pretty remarkable uh, outcome, isn't it? It really is. And, uh, you know, we would say that the special source is advantage thinking, that it's so much more than having a roof over a young person's head for two years. It's about the way the staff partner with each young person to really tailor the supports that they need to unlock their goals in life. And that deal that sits at the heart of it means that it's not about a service provider delivering a service to a young person. It's actually about both the young person and the service putting the work in together to do whatever it takes to help that young person move to a place of independence. Um, so it's a really powerful model. And look, I'm actually only six months into the role, but that was one of the things that drew me in was really just the, the solid evidence base and the incredible outcomes that the FOIA model achieves for young people. And in terms of uh, in terms of the longer term benefits, as far as, for example, long term sustainable housing and employment outcomes for young people who have been through the FOIA uh, model. I know there's uh, some thinking going in within the organisation with your ambassadors at the moment around how you can have an alumni network uh, and support and provide, I guess, ongoing um, connectivity or connection to people and, and support. Do you want to talk a bit about that, about how you're yeah. able to look at the longer term benefits that the models might be providing? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Um, what is really important to us is that the advantage thinking is happening at the core as well as in the services. And that means that at the heart, we really want to put young people front and centre in how we think about our entire strategy and the way we work nationally. Um, a big part of this that we're, we've are we been doing recently is working with a group of youth ambassadors who are all young people that are currently living in a foyer or have left usually within about the last five years. Um, what I have been blown away by is that this group of young people have not only turned their own lives in a really positive direction, they're now completely committed to how they can enable that to happen for other young people and really see more foyers come into communities across the country because they know just how important it is and the difference it can make to a young person. Um, so we've been working with this group of youth ambassadors to really shape up what might an alumni program look like that would give them a way of remaining connected even after the two year time of them living in a foyer has finished. Um, and in addition to that, we've also been looking at alongside the data measurement 
and collection and the, and the, the evidence base, how do we also create a pathway for young people to share their stories five years down the track, 10 years down the track in a very direct way? And part of that is about actually putting the, the power of data in the hands of young people themselves rather than having to do it all through services and through uh, others that potentially filter that information as well. So these are both areas that we'll be exploring in the next few years in particular to get the right infrastructure in place so that we can really, I suppose, get much clearer picture of the longitudinal data, but also really bring the direct voices and experiences of young people into that. Miss, can you tell us a bit about how a youth lawyer comes into being in a particular community across Australia? And with the target of having 50 in place by 2030, statistically that would suggest that the NT would be, you know, getting pretty close to having a one or two uh, FOIAs or at least be having conversations and thinking around youth FOIAs. But how are they typically championed? Who, how do these things get formed? Is it, is it, is it, is it government driven? Are there like local community organisations that are passionate and want to make a difference? Is it an alderman or a local council? Or, or how do these things typically get off the ground? What's the process? The answer, Peter, is all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. Every community is different. Um, look, I think one thing that is really driving me right now is the fact that we know we've got about 33 communities across the country trying to get a new youth foyer up and running. Um, they are all at very different stages of development. Um, for some, it's the seeds of an idea. For others, they've got some funding and they're seeking other funding. Um, it, it, it's varied based on, you know, each community. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, what we tend to see is that it usually begins with a group of local uh, players, whether that's a service provider or a community housing provider that are interested in the FOIA model, that see that there's demand and urgency for young people in their region, and they try and find out about how would they actually bring a FOIA to bear in their local area. Um, at that point, we usually get a phone call and we then work to really support each community with whatever it is that they need. Um, we have seen other examples where there's potentially been a more top-down selection fr from government. Um, for example, in Tasmania, the Tasmanian government was really committed to, uh, they call them youth to independence services, which are essentially foyers, and they've actually developed a strategy to bring five foyers into being in Tasmania. So that it is very different in different situations. Um, what we have done over the last 18 months is form something called the FOIA Invest Consortium. And this is a network of some of the big service providers across the country that are deeply committed to the FOIA model. Um, and we are using that consortium almost like the, the, the backbone organisation to look at how we can really scale the reach and the impact of FOIAs across the country. And also then working very closely with our broader network of service operators and also with the private sector and the impact investing community to look at how we can actually catalyze the development of FOIAs at scale rather than having every single community have to fight their own battle on their own. Um, because there's certainly, I think, uh, a lot of leverage to, to be gained if we can think of, a, figure out a model that is going to work in multiple locations at the same time. It's interesting. I see you've got a FOIA, I think, coming through in Townsville, and you've um, got other ones in the Gold Coast and and elsewhere across Australia um, coming through and coming through accreditation. Is it easier to make a case for a FOIA in a place like Townsville than say Darwin or Alice Springs because the economics stack up differently? Look, I think it's a good question that um, you'd have to ask the Townsville crew. Uh, so Townsville FOIA is led by Mission Australia and it has been a, a rocky ride over the last couple of years and there also was quite significant community pushback originally, um, which which I think largely had to do with the location of the FOIA and, and um, 
whether it was a high rise building or not. And I think that's just an example of the fact that every community context is different because the foyer in the Gold Coast is a high rise building and that's absolutely the right model for the Gold Coast. So it really is about figuring out, you know, how do we take this model that works at the core and tailor it to work for the local community? But, you know, I think like, like any initiative, it's absolutely critical that we work in partnership with communities to through that co-design process so that there is genuine buy-in and commitment to the model, um, which I know is definitely what Mission Australia and the Townsville um, group have been doing as well. Is there a little bit of a barrier to entry or hurdle because they are maybe you've got that capital investment up front to build the foyer and to get it to make, you know, it's got to be fit for purpose and, and well and well designed and fitted out. And then you've got the ongoing costs of providing the services and so forth. I'm assuming the the young people don't pay rent while they're there. Well, they do pay some sort of rent. They do pay, they do pay rent. Right, right. Um, and that's really part of the philosophy of working towards independence and not wanting to create a false experience of reality at the end of the two year period, but it, it is subsidized. Um, but you're absolutely right in thinking about the cost in those different areas of both the upfront capital investment, as well as the ongoing operating costs. Um, traditionally, we have seen that, that both have largely been funded by state and territory governments. What we are working on right now is a different model that looks at how we bring the private sector into the equation. And we're really working on how do we build an impact investing fund that uses private capital for the upfront infrastructure costs um, as a one-off payment, and then splits the operating costs between state and territory and federal governments pretty much 50-50 in line with what we've seen in the Accenture findings. Um, we think that that's, that's, that's appropriate. And the reason we have structured it this way is because in talking with communities across the country, we have found that actually the operating costs are one of the hardest elements to actually get that ongoing funding for. So if we can remove the need for government to pay for the upfront capital piece, we're hoping that we can extend um, the use of that government funding so that we can actually get more sustainability into the operating model. I think that might have answered one of the questions that I had, and we'll, I'd love to talk a bit more about impact investing in a moment. Um, but I think one of my questions to you would have been around um, that there is a lot of, I think um, the foundation itself has around about 80 or 90% private uh, funding, but not, there's not government funding for, for that foundation. There's an increasing um, uh, attractiveness around investment and interest in investment uh, from philanthropy and from the private sector into these foyers, which is terrific. In doing so, is there a risk we're letting government off the hook um, by not having to stump up the cash to help? Because ultimately, it is addressing homelessness, and isn't it? Yeah, look, I think it's a great question, and we're venturing into a very philosophical part of the debate, I believe. But, um, you know, in, in my view, it's absolutely not about letting government off the hook. Instead, it's about making the government dollar go further. So if we imagine we had three government dollars that we could put them all into one foyer or we could split them across three foyers and combine it with state government and territory governments and with private capital. So we're trying to make it go further so that we can reach more young people and achieve even better outcomes. And in today's current fiscal climate with increasing inflationary pressure on the budget, I think there's part of this that we just have to be pragmatic about realistically what will the government be up for funding and where do we need to get creative about bringing in investment from, from the private sector as well. So not letting government off the hook at all, in, in my view. As probably, like I think you said also before, around maximising the benefits from government, from every government dollar that goes into it as well, putting to good use. Um, yeah. There, there are one of the things the conundrums I think that we sometimes face in from a policy or advocacy perspective in, in a place like the territory is we have a lot of unmet demand for services for homelessness services and of course we need a lot more social and affordable housing build. We see some regions that might have particular programs and others that don't have any programs at all. So there's, I guess, there's a whole lot of different. Um, competing, um, I guess, uh, calls for funding, whether it be in at the crisis end, crisis accommodation end, or whether it be more in a housing first program. Against all of these different competing ends and where government should spend money or prioritise investment in as part of the housing continuum, 
what do you think is the case for youth voice and how they stack up compared to other forms of, of investment or other areas of investment? Sure. Look, look, I mean, I think this is also a really great question because I do like to think about the whole system and I recognise that four years are just one part of the bigger ecosystem of support needed for young people. Um, so I think the services we ha have are invaluable, including at the crisis end of the spectrum. But what we know is they're not sufficient to actually change the life trajectory of young people that experience crisis and, and homelessness. Um, we can see across the system that there are still huge gaps when it comes to particularly medium and long-term support for young people that present to specialist homelessness services. We know that 44,000 young people present every year nationally and that that figure hasn't shifted for a decade, which tells us that something in the system is missing to enable us to actually bring that number down. And if we actually do the analysis, which Accenture helped us to do, um, it's clear that for every young person that requests long-term supports, only 2% get their needs met. And for every young person that requests medium-term support, only 25% get their needs met. So if we zoom up and look at the whole picture, as valuable as the crisis and short-term accommodation is, it needs to be alongside short and medium-term accommodation and pathways that actually enable young people to no longer have to depend on the housing support system but can actually move into private and stable accommodation. And that's really what the FOIA model is about. Um, it's not always the right model for every young person, but for those that are looking to move to independence, we absolutely need to see more of that in the broader system so that we can enable young people to really transition through. There's quite a bit of talk recently, and I know Jim Chalmers with his budget, there's been referred to as a values capitalist, capitalism based budget, or, or I think earlier on it might have been referred to as a, as a social measures, a social outcomes budget as well. We're hearing talk of the, it's been reported, and I know you've had some things to say about this publicly as well, that you know the big four banks are looking at potentially putting in some seed equity funding um, to help establish a, like a wholesale bank that um, is able to aggregate some of these uh, funds and, and projects uh, that, that can then go into particular uh, projects um, with social and economic benefits. Can you just talk through, I guess as a philanthropist or as a um, private or a corporation, maybe with uh, corporate social responsibility aims, what's the case for them, what's in it for them in terms of investing, whether it be in social impact bonds or in some other mechanism that gets money to organisations like Youth Voice to, to do what they do and to help grow the scale? Mm. Look, I suppose it might help to reinforce that before I picked up this role, I was deeply involved in the corporate world that really was focused on this space, not just from a corporate social responsibility perspective at PwC, but also with the rise of ESG, which stands for, I'm sure you know, but in, in case some listening don't, environment, society, governance. Um, and what we're seeing is a huge rise in expectation and pressure on businesses to be very transparent about the way they're contributing to ESG. And I think at first we've seen the movement focus more on how do businesses mitigate their risks of getting dragged through, you know, the public media when they've made huge mistakes, like what we saw with Rio Tinto and, and Dugong Gorge. Um, but what I expect we'll be increasingly seeing is an expectation that business is really actively contributing value into our economy and our society, um, particularly through their ESG footprint. Um, Obviously, right now, the climate side of the equation has probably got a lot more um, steam than the social side of ESG, but I think that that's just to come. And we're already seeing the global standards and, and standards in particular regions being introduced. So there's just increasing accountability on business leaders to actually take this seriously and to be able to clearly um, respond not just to the pressure from their own shareholders, but also to pressure from customers, communities, employees. Um, so really, I think the case for, for business is there. 
And in fact, what we're seeing is that there is an increase in business who want to invest in these sorts of opportunities, but are hitting a barrier, particularly in the Australian market, where there's not a lot of investable propositions for them that are ready to go right now. So I think in the context of the wholesaler that you've been talking about, the FOIA model is a really great example of something that's ready to go right now. We've got 12 communities that have land ready to go, that have committed parties that I think would make an incredible case study to help Australia actually understand and come to terms with what we mean when we talk about values-based capitalism um, and how business can play a really meaningful role that is ultimately the best thing for young people. I'm interested in your thoughts without putting on the spot, of course, but just in terms of your thoughts around the Northern Territory, having a very high costs of program delivery, you know, got big logistics, uh, we've got lots of hospitalisations, lots of um, uh, disease as well, like rheumatic heart disease, which results in, uh, can result in medivacs from outlying communities of around $70,000 for emergency surgery, all sorts of costs for mental health, uh, drug and alcohol addiction, social and affordable housing costs are, are high, high to live up here. You yeah. can't help but think that if we could tap into some of these areas, there'd have to be a positive economic return and potentially even a coupon return for an investor that's looking for a modest um, return on a bond. Would you have a view on that? Yeah, look, absolutely. And I think given the complexity that you've just so eloquently outlined, I think that's just reason why we need models that actually are place-based and that treat each individual for their whole being, not just a particular slice of the equation. And I think that's something where the FOIA model can work really well because it's essentially um, a person-centered model within context of the place. And, you know, there's obviously things that are going to be outside of one's control, like the rising costs of delivering services in remote areas. But it's absolutely where I think we should be able to make a strong case to private investors that to make an investment in a, in a property with these integrated supports alongside a government contribution, we can actually generate the sort of social outcomes needed to also create a, a financial return for the investor. I'd love to see um, the seedling of an idea planted in the NT where we can see a youth foyer here in a not too distant future. Um, and you've outlined some different ways that uh, that they can, can grab hold in a community. What, what can people do who may be listening in or watching this uh, podcast? What can they do if they want to learn more about FOIAs and how maybe to get a group together to, to get this um, discussion gaining some momentum? Yeah, well, we would love to see some FOIAs in the Northern Territory as well, Peter. So, you know, I, I'd say a very real thing that I would love to offer is anyone can reach out to the FOIA Foundation and, and we'll see how we can support. Um, we're also working with the Brotherhood of St Lawrence on how do we actually roll out the kind of training and support needed for, for any community, wherever they are at in their journey. Um, but obviously I think it's really important that we continue to raise awareness in community about the value of the FOIA model and the outcomes that it can achieve. But importantly, that we're doing that with government as well. Um, and for all the reasons you've just outlined and, and, and knowing the, the rising crisis in the Northern Territory unfolding as we speak, um, I think being able to really offer up the FOIA model as part of the solution that can be very integrated, that can work in partnership with local First Nations communities, um, which is just absolutely essential. Um, I, I think that's really important and so I would really be also advocating that a first step would be to be working with community um, rather than imposing a solution from the outside. And that's where, you know, we're here to support as best we can, but it really has to be community led. I guess finally, also, in terms of non territory, just 1% of Australia's population, 1.3%, very small, um, 240 odd thousand people across a very large landmass. A lot of Aboriginal First Nations people disadvantaged. 
um, in poverty and in housing. There's a lot of a uh, lot of work to be done. There's a lot of uh, missing infrastructure, whether it be road or um, rail, telecommunications, water, you name it. There's a lot of challenges that we still have in uh, in remote Indigenous communities. Uh, I know that organisations like uh, Paul Ramsey Foundation, Australian Finance Group, and others are heavily involved with the FOIA. I'm just interested from a from from your overall experience um, whether there's a case to get those kind of organisations and philanthropy. I guess engaged with some of the issues we're trying to work through here in the NT and, and whether there's some stories we might be able to tell and share and work with those kind of organisations to potentially look at something they can partner with us on. Yeah, look, absolutely. And and I would say that in most cases they're already doing it. I think the Paul Ramsey Foundation in particular, who we are very grateful for their support at the FOIA Foundation, but I know that they are driving a lot of really important work particularly in the justice space as well as the domestic violence space, which obviously are all um, in, intersecting with, with these conversations. Um, so I think is absolutely on the radar of the Paul Ramsey Foundation. Um, we know that AFG is, is also very interested in not just how to, how to support the core, but how do we actually work on a community by community basis to create the right kind of models. Um, and I think that particularly as we navigate the upcoming budget and the response to Jim Chalmers' essay on values-based capitalism, there's potentially a lot more opportunity for us to be working together in, in the NT and bringing both philanthropy and, and business to the table. This has been absolutely wonderful having you joining us today. I'd really love to, to pencil in an NT FOIA as one of those 50. Let's let's see how we can make that come to fruition. I think that would be very exciting. And I'd like to, uh, I guess, uh, congratulate you on all the great work. I know it's only been six months, but uh, I know you've got a lot of passion for this role. Uh, I can't imagine the energy that must have been at your conference uh, late last year as well. Uh, I think the work you're doing is wonderful. Keep it, keep it going. And we really look forward to seeing progress over the coming months and years. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Peter. And I do say that the energy comes from the network. It's a really strong network with incredible young people leading the charge. And it's very hard not to wake up motivated every day with a network like that behind us. So let's bring one to the NT, Peter. Well done. Thank you. You've been uh, watching you. or listening to Liz Cameron Smith, the Chief Executive Officer of the FOIA Foundation in Australia. Thanks for joining us. And we look forward to you joining us on our next episode.